Chapter 3, Part 4 A Global Power In this section, Constitutional Monarchy The Creation of the Kingdom of Great Britain The Period of Enlightenment during the 18th Century Industrial Revolution The Slave Trade Formation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland Wars with France and the Crimean War Democracy Constitutional Monarchy, the Bill of Rights The Bill of Rights At the coronation of William and Mary, a Declaration of Rights was read. This confirmed that the king would no longer be able to raise taxes and administer justice without agreement from Parliament. The balance of power between monarch and Parliament had now permanently changed. The Bill of Rights, 1689 confirmed the rights of Parliament and the limits of the King's power. Parliament took control of who could be monarch and declared that the King or Queen must be a Protestant. A new Parliament had to be elected at least every three years, later this became seven years and now it is five years. Every year the monarch had to ask Parliament to renew funding for the army and the navy. These changes meant that, to be able to govern effectively, the monarch needed to have advisers, or ministers, who would be able to ensure a majority of votes in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. There were two main groups in Parliament, known as the Whigs and the Tories. The modern Conservative Party is still sometimes referred to as the Tories. This was the beginning of party politics. This was also an important time for the development of a free press, newspapers and other publications which are not controlled by the government. From 1695, newspapers were allowed to operate without a government license. Increasing numbers of newspapers began to be published. The laws passed after the Glorious Revolution are the beginning of what is called constitutional monarchy. The monarch remained very important but was no longer able to insist on particular policies or actions if Parliament did not agree. After William III, the ministers gradually became more important than the monarch but this was not a democracy in the modern sense. The number of people who had the right to vote for members of parliament was still very small. Only men who owned property of a certain value were able to vote. No women at all had the vote. Some constituencies were controlled by a single wealthy family. They were called the pocket boroughs. Other constituencies had hardly any voters and were called rotten boroughs. a growing population. This was a time when many people left Britain and Ireland to settle in new colonies in America and elsewhere, but others came to live in Britain. The first Jews to come to Britain since the Middle Ages settled in London in 1656. Between 1680 and 1720 many refugees called Huguenots came from France. They were Protestants and had been persecuted for their religion. Many were educated and skilled and worked as scientists, in banking, or in weaving or other crafts. The Act or Treaty of Union in Scotland William and Mary's successor, Queen Anne, had no surviving children. This created uncertainty over the succession in England, Wales, and Ireland and in Scotland. The Act of Union, known as the Treaty of Union in Scotland, was therefore agreed in 1707 creating the Kingdom of Great Britain. Although Scotland was no longer an independent country, it kept its own legal and education systems and Presbyterian Church. The Prime Minister When Queen Anne died in 1714, Parliament chose a German, George I, to be the next king, because he was Anne's nearest Protestant relative. An attempt by Scottish Jacobites to put James II's son on the throne instead was quickly defeated. George I did not speak very good English and this increased his need to rely on his ministers. The most important minister in Parliament became known as the Prime Minister. The first man to be called this was Sir Robert Walpole, who was Prime Minister from 1721 to 1742. The Rebellion of the Clans 
In 1745 there was another attempt to put a Stuart king back on the throne in place of George I's son, George II. Charles Edward Stuart, also known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, the grandson of James II, landed in Scotland. He was supported by clansmen from the Scottish Highlands and raised an army. Charles initially had some successes but was defeated by George II's army at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Charles escaped back to Europe. The clans lost a lot of their power and influence after Culloden. Chieftains became landlords if they had the favour of the English king, and clansmen became tenants who had to pay for the land they used. A process began which became known as the Highland Clearances. Many Scottish landlords destroyed individual small farms, known as crofts, to make space for large flocks of sheep and cattle. Evictions became very common in the early 19th century. Many Scottish people left for North America at this time. Robert Burns, 1759-96 Known in Scotland as the Bard, Robert Burns was a Scottish poet. He wrote in the Scots language, English with some Scottish words, and standard English. He also revised a lot of the traditional folk songs by changing or adding lyrics. Burns' best-known work is probably the song, Auld Lang Syne, which is sung by people in the UK and other countries when they are celebrating the New Year, or Hogmanay as it is called in Scotland. The Enlightenment During the 18th century, new ideas about politics, philosophy and science were developed. This is often called the Enlightenment. Many of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment were Scottish. Adam Smith developed ideas about economics which are still referred to today. David Hume's ideas about human nature continue to influence philosophers. Scientific discoveries, such as James Watt's work on steam power, helped the progress of the Industrial Revolution. One of the most important principles of the Enlightenment was that everyone should have the right to their own political and religious beliefs and that the state should not try to dictate to them. This continues to be an important principle in the UK today. The Industrial Revolution Before the 18th century, agriculture was the biggest source of employment in Britain. There were many cottage industries, where people worked from home to produce goods such as cloth and lace. The Industrial Revolution was the rapid development of industry in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries. Britain was the first country to industrialize on a large scale. It happened because of the development of machinery and the use of steam power. Agriculture and the manufacturing of goods became mechanized. This made things more efficient and increased production. Coal and other raw materials were needed to power the new factories. Many people moved from the countryside and started working in the mining and manufacturing industries. The development of the Bessemer process for the mass production of steel led to the development of the shipbuilding industry and the railways. Manufacturing jobs became the main source of employment in Britain. Richard Arkwright, 1732-92 Born in 1732, Arkwright originally trained and worked as a barber. He was able to dye hair and make wigs. When wigs became less popular, he started to work in textiles. He improved the original carding machine. Carding is the process of preparing fibers for spinning into yarn and fabric. He also developed horse-driven spinning mills that used only one machine. This increased the efficiency of production. Later, he used the steam engine to power machinery. Arkwright is particularly remembered for the efficient and profitable way that he ran his factories. Better transport links were needed to transport raw materials and manufactured goods. Canals were built to link the factories to towns and cities and to the ports, particularly in the new industrial areas in the middle and north of England. Working conditions during the Industrial Revolution were very poor. There were no laws to protect employees, who were often forced to work long hours in dangerous situations. Children also worked and were treated in the same way as adults. Sometimes they were treated even more harshly. 
This was also a time of increased colonization overseas. Captain James Cook mapped the coast of Australia and a few colonies were established there. Britain gained control over Canada, and the East India Company, originally set up to trade, gained control of large parts of India. Colonies began to be established in southern Africa. Britain traded all over the world and began to import more goods. Sugar and tobacco came from North America and the West Indies, textiles, tea and spices came from India and the area that is today called Indonesia. Trading and settlements overseas sometimes brought Britain into conflict with other countries, particularly France, which was expanding and trading in a similar way in many of the same areas of the world. Sheikh Dean Mohammed, 1759-1851 Mohammed grew up in the Bengal region of India. He served in the Bengal army and came to Britain in 1782. He then moved to Ireland and eloped with an Irish girl called Jane Daly in 1786, returning to England at the turn of the century. In 1810 he opened the Hindustan Coffee House in George Street, London. It was the first curry house to open in Britain. Mahomet and his wife also introduced shampooing, the Indian art of head massage to Britain. The Slave Trade This commercial expansion and prosperity was sustained in part by the booming slave trade. While slavery was illegal within Britain itself, by the 18th century it was a fully established overseas industry, dominated by Britain and the American colonies. Slaves came primarily from West Africa. Traveling on British ships in horrible conditions, they were taken to America and the Caribbean, where they were made to work on tobacco and sugar plantations. The living and working conditions for slaves were very bad. Many slaves tried to escape and others revolted against their owners in protest at their terrible treatment. There were, however people in Britain who opposed the slave trade. The first formal anti-slavery groups were set up by the Quakers in the late 1700s, and they petitioned Parliament to ban the practice. William Wilberforce, an evangelical Christian and a member of Parliament, also played an important part in changing the law. Along with other abolitionists, people who supported the abolition of slavery, he succeeded in turning public opinion against the slave trade. In 1807, it became illegal to trade slaves in British ships or from British ports, and in 1833 the Emancipation Act abolished slavery throughout the British Empire. The Royal Navy stopped slave ships from other countries, freed the slaves and punished the slave traders. After 1833, two million Indian and Chinese workers were employed to replace the freed slaves. They worked on sugar plantations in the Caribbean, in mines in South Africa, on railways in East Africa and in the army in Kenya. The American War of Independence By the 1760s, there were substantial British colonies in North America. The colonies were wealthy and largely in control of their own affairs. Many of the colonist families had originally gone to North America in order to have religious freedom. They were well educated and interested in ideas of liberty. The British government wanted to tax the colonies. The colonists saw this as an attack on their freedom and said there should be no taxation without representation in the British Parliament. Parliament tried to compromise by repealing some of the taxes, but relationships between the British government and the colonies continued to worsen. Fighting broke out between the colonists and the British forces. In 1776, 13 American colonies declared their independence stating that people had a right to establish their own governments. The colonists eventually defeated the British army and Britain recognized the colony's independence in 1783. War with France During the 18th century, Britain fought a number of wars with France. In 1789, there was a revolution in France and the new French government soon declared war on Britain. Napoleon, who became Emperor of France, continued the war. Britain's navy fought against combined French and Spanish fleets, winning the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. In 1815, the French wars ended with the defeat of the Emperor Napoleon by the Duke of Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. 
Wellington was known as the Iron Duke and later became Prime Minister. Admiral Nelson was in charge of the British fleet at Trafalgar and was killed in the battle. Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square, London, is a monument to him. His ship, HMS Victory, can be visited in Portsmouth. The British army also fought against the French. The Battle of Trafalgar, the 21st of October, 1805, was a naval engagement fought by the British Royal Navy against the combined fleets of the French Navy and Spanish Navy. In 1815, the French wars ended with the defeat of the Emperor Napoleon by the Duke of Wellington at the Battle of Waterloo. Wellington was known as the Iron Duke and later became Prime Minister. If Marshal Blucher doesn't come through now, they'll break every bone in my body. Good beans, Wellington. The Union Flag Although Ireland had had the same monarch as England and Wales since Henry VIII, it had remained a separate country. In 1801, Ireland became unified with England, Scotland, and Wales after the Act of Union of 1800. This created the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. One symbol of this union between England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland was a new version of the official flag, the Union flag. This is often called the Union Jack. The flag combined crosses associated with England, Scotland, and Ireland. It is still used today as the official flag of the UK. The Union flag consists of three crosses. The Cross of St George, patron saint of England, is a red cross on a white ground. The Cross of St Andrew, patron saint of Scotland, is a diagonal white cross on a blue ground. The Cross of St Patrick, patron saint of Ireland, is a diagonal red cross on a white ground. The Union flag is also known as the Union Jack. The crosses of the three countries combined form the Union flag. There is also an official Welsh flag, which shows a Welsh dragon. The Welsh dragon does not appear on the Union flag because, when the first Union flag was created in 1606 from the flags of Scotland and England, the Principality of Wales was already united with England. The Victorian Age in 1837, Queen Victoria became Queen of the UK at the age of 18. She reigned until 1901, almost 64 years. Her reign is known as the Victorian Age. It was a time when Britain increased in power and influence abroad. Within the UK, the middle classes became increasingly significant and a number of reformers led moves to improve conditions of life for the poor. I'm 81 years of age and have almost a billion citizens. I've been in office 62 years, making me the longest serving monarch in history. <clears throat> have we finished? The British Empire. During the Victorian period, the British Empire grew to cover all of India, Australia, and large parts of Africa. It became the largest empire the world has ever seen with an estimated population of more than 400 million people. Many people were encouraged to leave the UK to settle overseas. Between 1853 and 1913, as many as 13 million British citizens left the country. People continued to come to Britain from other parts of the world. For example, between 1870 and 1914, Around 120,000 Russian and Polish Jews came to Britain to escape persecution. Many settled in London's East End and in Manchester and Leeds. People from the Empire, including India and Africa, also came to Britain to live, work and study. Trade and Industry Britain continued to be a great trading nation. The government began to promote policies of free trade abolishing a number of taxes on imported goods. One example of this was the repealing of the Corn Laws in 1846. These had prevented the import of cheap grain. The reforms helped the development of the British industry, because raw materials could now be imported cheaply. Working conditions in factories gradually became better. In 1847, the number of hours that women and children could work was limited by law to 10 hours per day. 
better housing began to be built for workers. Transport links also improved, enabling goods and people to move more easily around the country. Just before Victoria came to the throne, the father and son George and Robert Stevenson pioneered the railway engine and a major expansion of the railways took place in the Victorian period. Railways were built throughout the empire. There were also great advances in other areas, such as the building of bridges by engineers such as Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Brunel was originally from Portsmouth, England. He was an engineer who built tunnels, bridges, railway lines, and ships. He was responsible for constructing the Great Western Railway, which was the first major railway built in Britain. It runs from Paddington Station in London to the southwest of England, the West Midlands and Wales. Many of Brunel's bridges are still in use today. The Clifton Suspension Bridge was designed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel and is spanning the Avon Gorge. British industry led the world in the 19th century. The UK produced more than half of the world's iron, coal, and cotton cloth. The UK also became a centre for financial services, including insurance and banking. In 1851, the Great Exhibition opened in Hyde Park in the Crystal Palace, a huge building made of steel and glass. Exhibits ranged from huge machines to handmade goods. Countries from all over the world showed their goods but most of the objects were made in Britain. The Crimean War. From 1853 to 1856, Britain fought with Turkey and France against Russia in the Crimean War. It was the first war to be extensively covered by the media through news stories and photographs. The conditions were very poor and many soldiers died from illnesses they caught in the hospitals, rather than from war wounds. Queen Victoria introduced the Victoria Cross Medal during this war. It honors acts of valor by soldiers. Florence Nightingale was born in Italy to English parents. At the age of 31, she trained as a nurse in Germany. In 1854, she went to Turkey and worked in military hospitals, treating soldiers who were fighting in the Crimean War. She and her fellow nurses improved the conditions in the hospital and reduced the mortality rate. In 1860 she established the Nightingale Training School for Nurses at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. The school was the first of its kind and still exists today, as do many of the practices that Florence used. She is often regarded as the founder of modern nursing. As Florence Nightingale said, just don't kill anybody. Ireland in the 19th century. Conditions in Ireland were not as good as in the rest of the UK. Two-thirds of the population still depended on farming to make their living often on very small plots of land. Many depended on potatoes as a large part of their diet. In the middle of the century the potato crop failed, and Ireland suffered a famine. A million people died from disease and starvation. Another million and a half left Ireland. Some emigrated to the United States and others came to England. By 1861 there were large populations of Irish people in cities such as Liverpool, London, Manchester and Glasgow. The Irish nationalist movement had grown strongly through the 19th century. Some, such as the Fenians, favoured complete independence. Others, such as Charles Stuart Parnell, advocated home rule, in which Ireland would remain in the UK but have its own parliament. And then, there were the IRA Fenians and the Communists the right to vote. As the middle classes in the wealthy industrial towns and cities grew in influence, they began to demand more political power. The Reform Act of 1832 had greatly increased the number of people with the right to vote. The Act also abolished the old pocket and rotten boroughs and more parliamentary seats were given to the towns and cities. There was a permanent shift of political power from the countryside to the towns but voting was still based on ownership of the property. This meant that members of the working class were still unable to vote. A movement began to demand the vote for the working classes and other people without property. Campaigners, called the Chartists, presented petitions to Parliament. 
At first they seemed to be unsuccessful, but in 1867 there was another reform act. This created many more urban seats in parliament and reduced the amount of property that people needed to have before they could vote. However, the majority of men still did not have the right to vote and no women could vote. Politicians realized that the increased number of voters meant that they needed to persuade people to vote for them if they were to be sure of being elected to parliament. The political parties began to create organizations to reach out to ordinary voters. Universal suffrage, the right of every adult, male or female, to vote, followed in the next century. In common with the rest of Europe, women in 19th century Britain had fewer rights than men. Until 1870, when a woman got married, her earnings, property and money automatically belonged to her husband. Acts of Parliament in 1870 and 1882 gave wives the right to keep their own earnings and property. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, an increasing number of women campaigned and demonstrated for greater rights and, in particular, the right to vote. They formed the women's suffrage movement and became known as suffragettes. Emmeline Pankhurst, 1858-1928 Emmeline Pankhurst was born in Manchester in 1858. She set up the Women's Franchise League in 1889, which fought to get the vote in local elections for married women. In 1903 she helped found the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU. This was the first group whose members were called suffragettes. The group used civil disobedience as part of their protest to gain the vote for women. They chained themselves to railings, smashed windows, and committed arson. Many of the women, including Pankhurst, went on hunger strike. In 1918, women over the age of 30 were given voting rights and the right to stand for parliament, partly in recognition of the contribution women made to the war effort during the First World War. Shortly before Pankhurst's death in 1928, women were given the right to vote at the age of 21, the same as men. Stop you. What are you going to do? Lock us all up. We're in every home. We're half the human race. You can't stop us all. You might lose your life before this is over. We will win. The Future of the Empire Although the British Empire continued to grow until the 1920s, there was already discussion in the late 19th century about its future direction. Supporters of expansion believed that the empire benefited Britain through increased trade and commerce. Others thought the empire had become overexpanded and that the frequent conflicts in many parts of the empire, such as India's northwest frontier or southern Africa, were a drain on resources. Yet the great majority of British people believed in the empire as a force for good in the world. The Boer War of 1899-1902 made the discussions about the future of the empire more urgent. The British went to war in South Africa with settlers from the Netherlands called the Boers. The Boers fought fiercely and the war went on for over three years. Many died in the fighting and many more from disease. There was some public sympathy for the Boers and people began to question whether the empire could continue. As different parts of the empire developed, they won greater freedom and autonomy from Britain. Eventually, by the second half of the 20th century, there was, for the most part, an orderly transition from empire to commonwealth, with countries being granted their independence. Rudyard Kipling, 1865-1936 Rudyard Kipling was born in India in 1865 and later lived in India, the UK and the USA. He wrote books and poems set in both India and the UK. His poems and novels reflected the idea that the British Empire was a force for good. Kipling was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1907. His books include The Just So Stories and The Jungle Book, which continue to be popular today. His poem called, If, has often been voted among the UK's favourite poems. It begins with these words. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you 
but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting. Or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good, nor talk too wise. Now let's recap what you need to know from this chapter. The change in the balance of power between Parliament and the monarchy. When and why Scotland joined England and Wales to become Great Britain. The reasons for a rebellion in Scotland led by Bonnie Prince Charlie. The ideas of the Enlightenment. The importance of the Industrial Revolution and development of industry. The slave trade and when it was abolished. The growth of the British Empire, and how democracy developed during this period. Thanks for watching. Have you tried the practice tests on my channel? Don't forget to like and subscribe for more study notes. Good luck! Thank you.